Good morning to everyone in whatever time, time zone you find yourself participating in this online version of the Arctic Observing Summit. For me, it is early morning mountain time, and I am recording this talk from home. Uh, I live in Boulder, Colorado, which I've shared a picture of here, and I'll share a little bit about what it's been like um, with our springtime weather. Uh, we've had everything from uh, a snowfall uh, less than a week ago to bright blue skies, turning our trails into mud. And we've had tons of migratory birds uh, on their northward migration come through the meadow behind my house. Um, so as lovely as it's been here, uh, I, I truly regret that due to the impacts of COVID-19 uh, that we can't be gathered in beautiful Akureyri together. Um, so another thing I would like to acknowledge uh, about Boulder, Colorado, is that I live and work on the traditional territories of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. And I've learned that 48 tribes, uh, contemporary tribal nations, are historically linked to the state of Colorado. In recognizing this, I'd like to share some additional thoughts for a successful meeting that were informed by Dr. Nakush Carlo, especially for this conference. The circumpolar Arctic is the home to many different indigenous peoples. Wherever you may be viewing this message, Seon, where I currently serve as chair, joins other Arctic organizations to honor and recognize the place-based knowledge of Arctic indigenous peoples and their ancestral and contemporary stewardship of their homelands. Seon welcomes all AOS participants to do the same. It is the responsibility of each of us individually to learn, read, and gain better understanding of the indigenous peoples and cultures with which we engage. We encourage everyone to use this greater understanding to enhance engagement, partnership, and co-production of knowledge with indigenous peoples. As you prepare for AOS 2020, I hope that you and those important to you are healthy and secure. It is an important time to consider the theme of this conference, observing to action. It is also an important time to consider the perils of inaction. In the spirit of action, our Icelandic hosts and remote organizers have done a remarkable job in transitioning our meeting to this online format, and we all thank them for these efforts. A critical ingredient in translating observing into action is speaking with a unified voice. Which brings me to our starting point for the need for a roadmap for Arctic observing and data systems. Today I'm going to be presenting Seon's proposed process for developing a roadmap for Arctic observing and data systems, or ROADS. This presentation serves as a call to the community of Arctic practitioners and experts who, want, who work along the obser observations to action spectrum. I hope you will see in the next 20 minutes that ROADS is designed to be a collaborative vehicle to unify the many voices of our broad community of practitioners into a more coherent and actionable collaborative strategy for Arctic observing. I'd like to draw your attention to the list of names on the left-hand side. These are the members of SAN's Road Mapping Task Force, which was impaneled last February to develop this process. The roads thus started as a collective effort, and that collective effort grew in August when we heard from more than a dozen reviewers. That collective effort will continue to grow at this Arctic Observing Summit, where thanks to the organizers and a special thanks to Hayo Iken, the ROADS process has been integrated into really every aspect of this summit. And this is where you will be invited to further vet and contribute to this process. My hope is that by the end of this presentation, I will have addressed these four critical questions. One, why do we need the roads process? What makes up the roads process? How do I get involved? And where will the roads process bring us? Let's start with why. The Arctic, its landscapes and seascapes, its ecology and its social systems are all undergoing rapid change, which challenge Arctic ways of life, decision-making and fundamental understanding of the Earth's system. Observational data Observational data underpin our understanding and support needed adaptive responses, yet observational networks are woefully underdeveloped in the far north. 
systemic barriers impact process at the global, local, and regional scales. I'll start by talking about the global scale. We consistently see in the images on this diagram, for example, is just a, sam uh, is just a sampling, that global networks achieve remarkable coverage over much of the planet, but not in the Arctic. We understand that there are two principal reasons for this. One, Arctic-specific processes and conditions, ice cover, seasonal darkness, extremes of cold and stratification, sensitive and tightly coupled systems. These combined hamper the use of standard obser observing technology and drive up costs. And second, we've also seen that the value proposition for Arctic observations, especially when viewed through the lens of global concerns, fails to compel the necessary funding levels for Arctic observing systems. Local and indigenous networks, uh, which, of which you just see a small sampling here, are extremely promising for filling gaps, especially gaps in wintertime observation. Indigenous observer networks tend to focus on community-driven concerns, and they add a much needed systems understanding to the observed changes. But capacity issues and knowledge system disconnects between indigenous and scientific knowledge can limit partnering progress. Oops, pardon me, I've gotta go back one. Regional efforts are in the best position to partner with both global and local networks to amplify their impact, and many do this with success. However, regionally, a third systemic issue is at play, and that is the diffusion of planning, implementation, and data assets across a complex multiplicity of Arctic organizations. Many refer to this as the alpha Arctic alphabet soup. This has resulted in a lack of consistent and holistic mechanisms to assess observing system priorities and link together these independently funded efforts. All of this hinders speaking with a unified voice. These issues collectively inspired the creation of the Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks process, or SAON. SAON is a joint initiative of the Arctic Council and the International Arctic Science Committee. It was created to strengthen multinational engagement in, in and the coordination of Pan-Arctic observing. In recognition of the complex dimensions of Arctic observing activities and the equally complex organizational patchwork of, of observing activities and infrastructure, SAM's intent as an open initiative is to unite in support of a systematic network, Arctic and non-Arctic countries, indigenous peoples, academia, industry, civil society, and other key stakeholders through structured facilitation. In 2018, SAON released a decadal strategic vision that was centered around three interwoven goals. One, create a roadmap to a well-integrated Arctic observing system. Two, promote free and ethically open access to all Arctic observational data. And three, ensure the sustainability of Arctic observing systems. Collectively, these combined make up the, uh, make up the roads process. Um, the, pardon me, collectively each goal supports the need for an integrated roadmap for Arctic observing and data systems or roads. A critical step on the pathway to developing the roads process one that speaks directly to articulating the value proposition for Arctic observations was the collaborative development of the International Arctic Observing Assessment Framework in 2017, uh, the cover of which is shown on the left-hand side of the slide uh, and is available through the SAN website. The expert elicitation process, both before and after an international workshop of 60 SAN partners, identified 12 Arctic specific societal benefit areas outlined on the right hand side of the slide that were further detailed into more than 140 key objectives for an observing system to fulfill. I'd like to describe some important specifics that begin to illustrate why an Arctic specific assessment framework is so critical to our efforts and how it moves us towards speaking with a unified voice. The framework sets out to be holistic by design which in and of itself is critical in the Arctic where socio-ecological systems are so tightly coupled. For example, food security 
is inherently linked to environmental quality, resilient communities, sociocultural services, and more. Similarly, climate and weather impact almost every benefit area. Linking objectives for observing in a single framework, which is done here, illustrates how seemingly unrelated concerns can share observing infrastructure, data products, and services. It helps us to identify where, it also helps us to identify where the observing system is falling short. This framework has already been successfully used by the European Commission's EMOVAR project, which used the framework to make the business case for Arctic observing. EMOVAR illustrated that even the partially measured benefits of improved shipping, search and rescue, oil spill response, forestry management, well outweighed the costs of the current investments in the Arctic observing system. This assessment framework, a critical step on the path to roads, can and should grow. AOS working groups will address recommendations towards improving the implementation of this assessment framework. As roads develops, its completed elements will converge into a systems level view of Arctic observing imperatives, requirements, and implementation strategies. It will inform opportunities for leveraging of existing work and areas for urgent investment that will demonstrably deliver soci broad societal benefit in the Arctic and beyond. The Arctic science ministers, funding programs, community-based programs, global initiatives, the private sector, nonprofits, and more have re repeatedly called upon Sayon uh, to speak with a unified voice. They are one eager audience. But the first audience for the Rhodes process is reflected best in you, the participants in the Arctic Observing Summit. Here, over the next few days, Sayan hopes that through participation in the Rhodes process, you will find the type of structured facilitation that you need to support your own objectives for observing. I hope this leaves you with a strong understanding of why Sayan is taking up this ambitious task. I'll turn now to the elements uh, that make up the Rhodes process. <clears throat> Seon's Road Mapping Task Force represents a cross-section of Seon's partners from indigenous organizations like the Inuit Circumpolar Council to regional efforts like Interact and the Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program to global organizations like the Group on Earth Observations and the World Meteorological Organization. Also included in the task force were program managers and policymakers. We spent many months reviewing the best practices for network planning uh, across scales and deliberated key Arctic considerations. In the process, we recognized three guiding principles, or you could even call them critical success factors for roads to follow. These build upon the existing guiding principles of the Sayon strategic plan. First, roads must include funding for indigenous people's equitable partnership and active participation. Here, we're particularly attuned to the dialogue of working group three at the summit, our, indi our indigenous food security working group, to ground truth the precepts and elements of the roads process, to help inform how it can move towards uh, becoming a framework for knowledge co-production, and to give us uh, the guidance we need to assure our success. Second, it should complement and integrate without duplication the current planning approaches used by existing efforts. Here, we recognize that many communities already have their own planning and implementation processes. It is not our desire to overwrite them or to create a heavy lift to translate their efforts into the roads process. We want roads to be sort of a metal layer that operates lightly across these, uh, these many initiatives. Last, it should support, it should support stepwise development through a flexible, collaborative, and evolving structure. Again, we know that partner networks are at different stages of readiness and capacity. To be successful, we must allow roads to proceed piece by piece as efforts mature. It was our intention to integrate each of these principles into the planning elements of the roads process. I'll turn to these elements next and help to illustrate where these principles were particularly useful in our choices. <clears throat> Value tree analysis is a methodology that is a natural application for the Arctic societal benefit framework I discussed previously. 
This provides the top of the tree, or in this case on the diagram, the left-hand side. These analyses support system level views of how observations feed forward through a linked set of value added products and applications in support of societal benefit. I've generated a generic example of how this works based on a single SBA, food security, which in the SEON framework was subdivided into the three areas shown on the screen, just to the right, moving to the right across the diagram. These sub areas ideally, um, these are supported ideally by a suite of tailored applications guided by the societal requirements shown here generically as assessments, surveys, forecasts, projections, public service warnings. On the other side, we see through a generic representation the components of the Arctic observing system that should support food security, from remote sensing systems to human observers to automated in situ networks. These feed forward into value-added data products as shown. And what sits in between is all too often where translating observations to actions fail. In fact, it fails so often it has its own name in academia, the Valley of Death. It is, particular, it is a particularly difficult translation to make in academic settings where a recent Copernicus study found that over 70% of Arctic observations are currently supported. So it's an important problem for us to take on at this moment. It is here that a second planning element identified by the Road Mapping Task Force comes into play, and that is the essential Arctic variable or essential Arctic process. Essential variables are a planning element widely used by the global networks. It's important to emphasize that though the term variable is used, the meaning is conceptually broader than what a single observation or measurement might include. It's often closer to the concept of a phenomena or a process. Essential variables are where societal and scientific requirements for an observing system converge. They support the translation of societal requirements into observing system requirements or specifications as they're also known and they support the coordination of observing implementation strategies. I'll give some examples of what essential Arctic variables or EAVs might look like in a moment, um, but first I'll talk a little bit about the steps uh, that help to create a fully defined essential variable. <clears throat> The SEON task force envisioned three important steps uh, to begin adopting essential Arctic variables or processes into roads. The first step is the, is the identification, um, the initial identification of an essential variable. And here it was uh, agreed that roads essential Arctic variables will be identified for their criticality to supporting Arctic societal benefit, either through value tree analysis as we just saw or, for, uh, or through other types of rigorous analysis processes. A key charge to the Arctic Observing Summit working groups is to speak to the criteria that roads should use for this. Once identified, the requirements for observing and data management for EAVs should be translated from this uh, established societal benefit. For example, what spatial or temporal resolutions are needed? How quickly must the information be delivered? what types of data platforms are needed. The diagram I've just brought up on the right-hand side shows an example uh, of just part of the definitions that sit under the global essential variable um, for sea ice. Um, and what's interesting in this example is that the global variable for sea ice was driven uh, by climate as a societal benefit, climate projections. And you can see how, the, how using that single societal benefit drives the scales of uh, observing, particularly the spatial scales, towards, uh, towards the very broad uh, spatial, spatial scales, and also tends to drive the, the time scales up towards um, months to years. <clears throat> but what, oops, pardon me, I went one too many. Uh, but what we anticipate is that uh, if we should adopt sea ice as an essential Arctic variable, um, that this would that would extend the requirements towards lower latency and lower spatial scales for relevance um, for uh, 
at scales that are more relevant to local concerns. For example, fast ice uh, and its relationship to travel and food security. Once requirements are defined, the specific technologies and collaborative strategies for implementing the observing and data systems are then addressed. A compelling vision for integration uh, from satellite scale through local observers was used by the Community-Based Observing Network Systems, or CBONS project. Such implementation approaches, this end-to-end this, uh, -end integration of observing systems, are highly relevant for the ROADS process. Again, a vital objective of, of the ROADS process is to bring focus and coherence to the most imperative aspects of the Arctic observing system, those aspects that are going to pay multiple dividends across a wide range of benefits. So in identifying essential Arctic variables, which many of you will be working on in your working groups, uh, I just want to remind us that we should scale our ambitions accordingly. If the list becomes too long, it will hamper progress. The Road Mapping Task Force imagined that essential Arctic variables might be identified in two different ways. The first is through reviewing the essential variables of the global network system, such as the sea ice example I showed previously, and recognizing where urgent progress is needed to improve their Arctic requirements and implementation. The second is through recognizing where important Arctic-specific phenomena or processes have been overlooked by the global system. I'll turn to an example of each of these next. As I mentioned, sea ice is already recognized um, as an essential variable of both the global ocean and climate observing systems. However, the previous mention, previously mentioned limitations in its societal benefit scope have left many important issues unaddressed. In this image shared by Dr. Hayo Eichen et al. from a publication submitted to Biosciences, also a value tree representation, they illustrate how expanding the scope of societal benefit to include coastal livelihoods, food security, coastal protection, um, also draws in different observing and data networks. Here, the Alaska Arctic Observatory and Knowledge Hub, or AOK, and ALOCA, the Exchange for Local Observations and Knowledge of the Arctic, and it supports uh, progress on things like land fast ice st stability and trafficability um, and identification of coastal ice berm types. This is an excellent example of how the roads process can extend the implementation of the global networks while also serving a great range of local concerns. <clears throat> In this example, provided courtesy of an awarded proposal led by Mark Serez, the second type of essential Arctic variable, or here more appropriately essential Arctic process, is presented. One that is of utmost significance to people living in the Arctic, but not, ad not addressed globally, and that is rain on snow events. This value tree documents their proposed work to address the impacts of these events on, on food security topics like reindeer herding, ecosystem health, safety of travel, and community infrastructure. In this case, they're working with existing data products from, existing, from the existing observing system, as well as the documented events made by local observers through the LEO network. They propose to develop a suite of applications in partnership with end users to support Arctic societal benefit. While they did not conceive of their proposal uh, as one contributing to an essential Arctic process, it is nonetheless a compelling example of the type of integration needed to address societal benefit. What's more, it is a valuable model to follow for funding the development of, uh, of future essential Arctic variables. Which brings us to our third question. How do I get involved in the roads process? As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, the organizers of the AO AOS have brought several aspects of the road proce roads process into each working group shown here in this table. These are areas where the road mapping task force recognized that the process needed greater articulation and buy-in. First, we are asking several working groups to speak directly to the criteria for selecting a small subset of highly impactful essential Arctic variables or processes. 
These groups are also going to generate a family of examples, similar, similar to the ones I've just shown, to support our collective understanding of what the scope of essential Arctic, Arctic variables should be, uh, and to recommend types of activities uh, that could be integrated under them. Second, we recognize that the roads process is going to generate a lot of information that will need to be carefully structured with an eye towards accessibility. The organization of this information is what we are referring to as a schema, uh, a common term used in the data community, and several groups will make recommendations for that. And last, the people aspect of the roads process, how to get involved. This part of the process especially needs your input and your participation. It is envisioned that expert panels will work to bring forward essential Arctic variables from identification through implementation. A topical expert panel might bring forward one or more essential Arctic variables. Working group five, uh, concerned with the global networks, has initiated, has initiated work on a structure to engage the appropriate global and regional networks into the expert panel process. Working group three, the indigenous food security working group, has offered to work on an engagement strategy for the local networks. Which groups get involved will depend on which EAVs are supported under roads. We recognize that proposals will be necessary to support the work of some expert panels, and several current proposal opportunities in the US and, er and Europe are well matched to supporting this type of work. For decision making in the roads process, we propose to have an advisory panel that will oversee and assure that expert panels follow the guiding principles and that work is well integrated across the, the expert panels, that we are, aren't being duplicative in our efforts across the expert panels. For this, we're asking each working group to make specific recommendations about either which organizations or individuals um, should serve on the, uh, the advisory panel. And in some cases, as for indigenous representation, how their time should be supported. Which brings us to our last question. Where do we envision that the roads process will bring us? I'll leave you with these three thoughts. First, as we recognized at the beginning of this talk, in order to enhance and expand the Arctic observing system to meet societal needs, we need to focus, we need focus and shared planning methodologies. Developing a clear and short list of essential Arctic variables will bring this coherence to our planning efforts. Second, the expert panel process under roads, which will be accountable to our guiding principles, in particular, the, in particular, the equitable engagement of indigenous peoples, will strengthen our Arctic observing collaborations and results. And third, the implementation strategies and investment plans we develop as a result of the roads process will support our need to speak with a unified voice to our national funding bodies, our science ministers, our partner organizations, and more. It will provide a systems level view of Arctic observing needs and assets, helping us to maximize the return on our observing system investments. I would like to close with a word on relationships and community building. First, by drawing your attention to this important document that was created by Dr. Nikush Carlo and the video prepared by Daniel Stickman to convey the AOS 2020 codes of conduct. The success of our efforts rests on the inclusiveness of our community of practitioners. Meetings are an important time to learn from each other, to hear all points of view, to share what's important to you, and to recognize when your privilege might be carrying your voice further than others. Meetings must be a place where we all feel safe, recognized, and respected. At this time, when our stress levels and vulnerabilities are heightened, when we feel how much we are bringing our whole self into our work, it is critical to focus on the quality of our relationships with one another. I invite you to spend time with each of these resources and to reflect on how you can incorporate these thoughts into AOS 2020. Colleagues, I thank you for your attention and support of SEON and the ROADS process. I wish wellness and security to you, your families, and communities. And I especially wish you a successful online Arctic Observing Summit. Thank you.